Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining today. It's a real uh, treat to be able to invite Dr. Gavin Jones to join us from IBM Almaden. Uh, we were hoping that this would be our very first uh, kind of in-person slash hybrid uh, interdisciplinary seminar, but we, we, we kind of, things always seem to happen, so we hope your foot gets better soon. Um, and so just talk a little bit about Dr. Jones. He's an IBM Quantum Technical Ambassador, a research staff member, and he's the manager of the Quantum Applications Group at IBM Research Almaden. Dr. Jones is a computational chemist with interests in performing quantum chemistry with quantum computers, catalysis, molecular properties, the formation of functional advanced materials, and polymer degradation. Dr. Jones completed his PhD in theoretical and uh, computational organic chemistry at the University of California, Los Angeles, go Bruins, that's where I did my degree as well. And then prior, um, uh, and he did uh, po postdoctoral research at MIT, and then he joined IBM Research in 2010 as a postdoctoral researcher becoming a research staff member in 2013, and then the manager of the Quantum Applications Group in 2020. Uh, Dr. Jones has received two outstanding techno technical achievement awards from IBM and was awarded an FP Global Thinkers Award in the Innovator category by Foreign Policy Magazine for his achievements in sustainability and recycling. Uh, so with that, I'll turn turn things over to Dr. Jones for his seminar, and we'll definitely have question uh, question time at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Irwin. Um, let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay, and okay, all right. Let's get started. Um, so hello everyone. Um, thank you for coming in today. Um, it's been great meeting everyone so far today. Of course, um, IBM Almaden and San Jose State already has a very uh, deep and uh, fulfilling relationship. Um, I hope that we will also have more chances to meet and interact and develop some relationships in, in quantum computing. Um, today, I'm going to talk about quantum computing for chemistry, which is one of the main focuses of my group. We are also um, interested in um, applications in physics. Um, for material sciences, as well as for biology. But today I'm just gonna be focused on, on, on chemistry. So this uh, presentation will be an overview of the current status of the field. I will try not to be overly technical. Um, uh, so the outline is, is shown here. Um, first I'll provide an overview of IBM quantum. Then I will switch gears and delve um, into quantum computing for chemistry, which is the, the area of research for my group. I'll talk about some of the early progress, then about where we are hoping to be in the, in the very long term. Then I will kind of provide a, a dose of reality by talking about where we are. And then I will conclude with some um, near-term use cases where we have actually used uh, quantum computing for chemistry applications. Um, so first I will start off by talking about IBM Quantum. So IBM Quantum is a, a joint effort between um, IBM Research, IBM Systems, and uh, Global Business Services. Um, the development of quantum technologies at, at IBM is a global effort um, for which work is being done in many of um, our research labs the world over. Um, and there are different interests in, in different labs. For example, much of the work in, in applications is being done in Yorktown Heights, um, in Zurich, and in Almaden in, in my group, although some work is being done in, in Ireland and, and in Africa as well. Um, the experimental work, um, hardware work, is being driven mainly by um, researchers and developers at the main research site in, in Yorktown Heights in New York, but there's some work being done at Almaden and in Zurich as well. So the, the hardware um, actually drives a lot of our, of our efforts in quantum computing. So this shows a bird's eye view of the pillars of quantum computing. So and this comprises uh, a quantum computing community such as the IBM um, Quantum Network with researchers, engineers, and other advocates. Um, uh, it, it comprises development of a software API such as, as Qiskit. Um, with which researchers can interact with the hardware. Uh, the hardware itself, which is the core of the pillar, uh, the core, a key component of the core is hardware aware applications, which is a type of work that my group focuses on. So this means ensuring that problems that we investigate 
take advantage of current hardware, but can also respond to newly developed hardware with higher quantum volumes, more qubits, faster processors, and so on. Um, so this is the path that we envision will allow us to derive quantum advantage um, for the, the hardware being developed at, at, at IBM. Um, so the performance of our system is not only dependent on the number of qubits or the scale of our systems, but also on the quality of the qubits, dependent on a metric called quantum volume, which indicates the neat ability of chips to execute circuits. Um, also by this newly developed metric called CLOPS, or circuit layer operations per second, which evaluates the speed of the devices or how many circuits we can actually run in a given time. As you can see, we've made tremendous progress in a short amount of time. Um, we've only really started uh, ramping up development of quantum computing since about 2016 or so. So in five years, we've actually made a whole lot of progress, but we will keep pushing to improve these metrics on our devices. Um, here I show potential use cases and applications of quantum computing for various industries. As you can see, um, at IBM, we believe that a number of techniques are applicable to, to many different in industries, and quantum computing could demonstrate value for industries that many of you may eventually end up working in. For example, quantum computing um, applications in machine learning may have an impact on the chemicals and petroleum industry, in the healthcare and life sciences industry, in the financial services industry, in manufacturing and distribution and logistics industry. So um, I'm going to switch gears um, and, and segue into to quantum computing for um, chemistry at this point. And I will start off by highlighting some of the early efforts at IBM Quantum as, as demonstrated for chemistry applications. Um, as you're probably aware, um, in 2017, IBM published a report in, in Nature magazine, which demonstrated for the first time that a physical quantum device had been made under experimental conditions, and that the physical device could be used to run quantum simulations on chemical systems. So the researchers um, performed simulations on the association of various hydrides, such as hydrogen, lithium hydride, and beryllium hydride um, on a seven qubit device. And they show that where the simulations could predict the association of hydrogen um, uh, almost exactly, there's a lot of scatter in the dissociation profile for beryllium hydride. And most notably, there is a very pronounced bump in the intermediate region for the association of lithium hydride. About a year later, IBM demonstrated that results involving lithium hydride could be improved by up to an order of magnitude by implementing an error mitigation protocol. In this case, they show that by stretching the microwave pulses used to control the device at a constant factor, they could apply um, a Richardson extrapolation technique to mitigate the noise measured in, in these simulations. So this is an example of zero noise extrapolation. Next, I'll talk about some potential very long-term use cases of quantum computing for chemistry applications. In general, our long-term goals involve the application of quantum computing to produce real-world solutions for challenges in chemistry and material sciences, such as catalysis, electrochemistry, and absorption. Um, as I did before, I will again highlight various industrial sectors of chemistry for which we believe that there's potential for the use of quantum computing. And I would provide some hypothetical use cases for each of these industrial sectors. But I wanna emphasize that we're not really currently working on any of these use cases. And in fact, we have quite a way to go before we can work on any of these problems with a, with a high degree of accuracy. So the first example shown here is for the petroleum industry. Uh, of course, one of the primary goals of the industry is to make fuels. Uh, this example shows the, the catalytic reduction of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. This could also possess important implications for carbon capture and greenhouse gas reduction. One challenge to developing new types of cat catalysts to accomplish this goal is to develop fundamental atomic level understanding of carbon dioxide activation and quantum and computation could play a critical role in this discovery process. 
The complexity arises because these catalysts involve transition metals. Systems with one transition metal are hard to simulate accurately. There's a possibility of multiple spin states. The fact that you'll be looking at transition states of reactions and many different types of reaction mechanisms, such as radical mechanisms, ionic mechanisms, uh, neutral mechanisms are possible. And they may be really hard to distinguish by using popular methods in current use, such as uh, single determinant DFT wave functions. Transition metals involving bimetallic complexes as an additional layer of complexity that may not be well characterized by DFT methods. Uh, Multi-reference methods are most appropriate, but it is difficult to actually perform these types of calculations on, on classical hardware. This example is for electrochemistry. Uh, one of the goals in this industry is to make uh, long lasting battery batteries. This example shows differences between two types of potential battery technologies. For the sodium air battery, which is shown on top, researchers have observed that sodium superoxide is formed, but they haven't observed formation of sodium peroxide. In contrast, for the lithium air battery, researchers have observed that lithium peroxide is formed, but they can only presume that lithium superoxide is formed on the way to forming the peroxide. Uh, they don't know the, the cause of these differences. Again, we expect that computation could play a critical role in studying these processes. The complexity arises because these processes involve transition states for reactions involving radical processes, and such cases may not be well treated by DFT. So again, multi-reference methods would be most appropriate. Now, this final example concerns the prospects of quantum computing for chemistry in the pharma industry. If someone wanted to explore the binding of a chemical compound to the active site of an enzyme, one would, could screen closely related comp complexes or compounds, sorry, with, uh, with computational techniques. However, the uh, energy difference for, uh, differences for species like the, the, the very closely related ones shown here are very difficult to compute with, with great precision. Um, here, we would need highly accurate methods to approach um, that approach full CI quality, um, those ones would be the most appropriate, but those are currently difficult to implement on classical hardware, apart from systems involving uh, a few heavy atoms. So in this section, I will talk about where we are currently in terms of performing chemistry simulations with quantum computing. First, um, it's important to recognize that computational chemistry spans diverse length scales and time scales. From quantum chemistry, in which researchers are trying to model atomic interactions as accurate as possible using the Schrodinger equation, to um, lattice models in which we investigate the electronic structure of surfaces or investigate interactions of substrates with the surfaces using techniques such as the Hubbard model, to molecular dynamics in which we try to determine how small molecules, peptides, polymers, solvents, and so on, uh, move around and, and interact with each other. And these are dependent on Newton's equation of motion. And these contrast with uh, Mises scale and continuum model simulations that are dependent um, arguably on engineering considerations rather than say uh, physical or, or chemical concepts. Um, so I will provide a few more details on quantum mechanics and, and, and molecular dynamics. Um, quantum mechanics uh, utilizes the Schrodinger equation, as I mentioned before. Um, various methods may be employed for quantum mechanical calculations. So ab initio or electronic structure methods, DFT methods, semi-empirical methods. Um, each of these is used extensively for different applications. Uh, electronic structure methods uh, solve the electronic Schrodinger equation given the positions of the nuclei and the number of electrons. Uh, there are a number of examples, such as, as the ones shown here. In principle, one can systematically improve the methods by going from hartree fock and adding on successive improvements of electron correlation to get to the exact or, or full CI limit. DFT methods are also used extensively. They utilize functionals of the electron density to arrive at an approximate treatment of the, the correlated motions of electrons beyond hartree fock Again, there's a real alphabet soup of methods um, in DFT. 
In contrast to the electronic structure methods, however, there is no reliable way to improve your computation by going to the next better functional. Some empirical methods are based on the Hartree Fock, but make many approximations and obtain some parameters from empirical data, and they need to be extensively parameterized. Um, they're useful for calculations on large molecules, but it requires that the semi empirical method must have been parameterized by similar molecules. Um, so I've highlighted the electronic structure methods here because this is currently the focus for IBM, mainly due to the fact that methods can be systematically improved to the full CI limit. But given the fact that we're currently working with a small number of noisy qubits, we've also been trying to develop embedding approaches that leverage quantum computation focused on the, th the chemical phenomena of interest, and the rest of the system is treated with DFT, for example. Um, now moving on to molecular dynamics, um, the, the forces in molecular dynamics are described by Newton's second law of motion, um, F equals ma, or the negative of the potential. The energies are comprised of covalent energies defined by the bonds, angles, and torsions, and non-covalent energies defined by electrostatics and van der Waals forces. The methods may be um, fully atomistic, or may employ coarse graining methods in which molecules or molecular fragments are treated as beads. You can also adopt hybrid systems such as QMMM, in which portions of the system, for example, reacting molecules, are treated by quantum mechanical methods, and the rest of the system, for example, surrounding solvent, is treated with molecular mechanics. And uh, Monte Carlo methods are, are an alternative to using uh, molecular dynamics methods. Um, so in this section, I'll talk about what we, we can do today and what some of the challenges um, are still, what, what are some of the challenges that we still have, have to uh, tackle. Um, so most of the efforts in quantum simulations for chemistry has been on using quantum chemistry, um, not molecular dynamics or, or molecular, um, or looking at some of the engineering um, techniques and so on. Uh, we've been mainly focused on quantum chemistry, although there has been some work on, on molecular um, dynamics. Um, we've had some degree of success, but there's still a lot of work to do. So we have developed uh, several error mitigation techniques, such as those designed to deal with readout device error and those to perform noise extrapolations, as I mentioned um, earlier in the talk. We've also developed strategies to reduce the number of qubits required to simulate larger molecules. For example, uh, exploiting symmetry, um, using frozen cores, and the use of active spaces for reactions. There's been some very preliminary work on the use of quantum computing to model larger molecules, such as peptides and proteins in a coarse-grained framework. Um, but beyond this, it's unclear if new algorithms need to be developed for molecular dynamics. In terms of methods for simulations involving small molecules, uh, we can perform quantum simulations with uh, QUCCSD, which is a, a unitary form of CCSD, which I mentioned, which um, appeared earlier on some of the slides. Um, so QUCCSD is suitable for simulations involving quantum algorithms but currently only on quantum simulators. We can't actually use QUCCSD on hardware as yet. Um, there are heuristic onsets such as RY, RYRZ, and SwapRZ, and other variations that can be implemented with Qiskits, which is the software that we use to actually um, perform these simulations. And these are guesses to the wave function that can be used on quantum simulators and can also be used on quantum hardware, in contrast to QUCCSD, which could only be used on, on simulators. Uh, we've, uh, we've developed, near, well, we've um, used near-term algorithms such as VQE um, to perform uh, hybrid simulations based on calculations partly done on classical hardware and partly done on quantum hardware or with quantum simulators. Um, there are other quantum algorithms such as QSC and KITE that are currently being explored for certain types of uh, use cases. 
So the quantum simulations that I, I spoke about were performed using um, an, a minimal basis set. So STO3G or STO6G in some cases. Um, and this is one of the real limitations of using an FCI approximation um, because we can't polarize atoms, we can use diffuse functions and so on. Um, but my group has recently shown that you can use, um, you can use larger double zeta basis sets to perform calculations on molecular systems, but so far only involving quantum simulations, meaning only on quantum simulators. Nothing has been de demonstrated on quantum devices as yet. And I conclude this section by noting that we still need to um, extend our predictive power, um, but we have made some progress in applying error mitigation techniques to, to chemistry problems to reduce the, the, the errors that we are, we're seeing. Uh, we want to explore more ch challenging um, scenarios, such as use cases involving strong electronic correlation. But I also know that some of these issues are not only related to the limited number of qubits that we, um, that we have today, but, but it's also limited by the complexities of the algorithms, like VQE, the, the error profiles of the qubits, and so on. And all of these complexities um, combine to limit the depths of circuits that can be used and consequently the number of useful qubits that can be used. So even for uh, devices comprising several dozen qubits, around only 10 or so qubits are actually useful for routine chemistry, quantum chemistry simulations. But we are working on algorithms that will allow us to double the number of qubits for chemistry, which I'll expand on later. And um, a new uh, technique called Kiskit runtime has been developed, which brings the classical computation closer to the quantum hard hardware, uh, thereby reducing the time spent on these simulations. Now note that other types of problems such as, um, or other types of applications such as optimization or quantum optimization or quantum machine learning that utilize other types of algorithms may not be limited in quite the same way as um, chemistry using VQE is currently. So um, how do we compute the number of qubits that are required for chem quantum chemistry and a quantum computer? And what are some strategies for reducing the number of qubits required for simulation? Um, you've probably seen a slide um, similar to this one, um, which shows caffeine and the number of qubits in that case, um, 160 qubits would be required to represent the, the states of caffeine on a quantum device. So this is similar, but shows uh, lithium TFSI. And this, in this case, uh, 176 qubits would be needed. Um, how, how do we come up with these numbers? Um, well, this has to do with some chemistry theory and how we map orbitals used to describe a molecule to qubits. Um, well, recognize that molecular orbitals are comprised of atomic orbitals that we show here for the hydrogen molecule, in which two hydrogen 1s atomic orbitals, orbitals combine to give a bonding spatial orbital and an anti-bonding spatial orbital. So these two spatial orbitals are comprised of four spin orbitals, each of which maps onto a qubit. So in other words, one spin orbital maps onto one qubit. We can perform this analysis for other elements of the periodic table. So as shown here, each element in period one has one atomic orbital that we need to account for. And these comprise two spin orbitals and are thus mapped to two qubits. Each element in period two has five atomic orbitals, which would be mapped to 10 qubits and so on. Um, the ordering of the elements for the element Orbital, the ordering of the orbitals for the elements in each period is understood by the, the off ball principle shown here, which signifies that elements in the fourth period fill the 4s orbital before the 3d orbital, and so on. So, going back to lithium TFSA, um, we can take the chemical formula and list out the atom types, the number of atoms, the number of orbitals per atom and compute the total number of spin orbitals for each type of atom. And after summing these up, we get 176. Um, so that would mean that 176 spin orbitals would be mapped to 176 qubits. And actually we can already start reducing this down to um, 
to 174 by using a particular type of mapping technique called spin parity mapping. And this we actually get for free. Um, so we can use that strategy to, uh, for any molecule to compute the number of qubits that would be required to perform a simulation using a quantum device or a simulator. Um, but as shown here, the number of qubits blows up really quickly, even for the simplest of molecules, if we use a full set of um, spin orbitals. So um, if we want to look at something like sulfuric acid, we get to around 54 qubits. The, the largest system that we have at IBM, right now at least, the 65 qubits, we're hoping to get 127 qubits by the end of the year. But um, even then, it would be um, because of the, the complexity of the, the, orb, the, the algorithm that we're using and the, the limited depth that we can use, we're not gonna be able to simulate 54 qubits on that computer um, for this molecule. Um, so given the, that we need a lot of qubits to represent even simple molecules, um, can we actually use the full set of orbitals? And I just, as I just described, uh, well, the answer is no, um, except for perhaps the very smallest molecules. But there are various techniques that we can use to reduce the number of qubits um, in use of a quantum device to only ones that are absolutely necessary. Let's talk briefly about some of these strategies. Um, the scenario on the left shows what would happen if we didn't have to worry about qubit reduction strategies. That is, all of the core valence and virtual orbitals are used, and thus 176 qubits would be required for a lithium TFSI. One popular strategy that is commonly used in the classical quantum chemistry is to focus on an active space in which we treat the valence and some or all of the virtual orbitals completely with some methods. With some method, uh, for example, a highly accurate schema, like uh, a copper cluster, while the rest of the orbitals are treated at a lower level as exemplified by the scenario shown in the middle. Uh, one can, of course, perform uh, appropriate adjustments on the active space so that fewer or more judiciously chosen valence and virtual orbitals are used to represent the chemical phenomena uh, or interaction of interest as shown in, in the panel on the right. So the strategy used in the middle panel in which we freeze core orbitals is, is exemplified here. Um, when we do this for all of the elements in TFSI, we will end up with eight spin orbitals for each atom. And by summing these up, we will arrive at 128 qubits. And after applying reduction by spin parity that I spoke of earlier, we then end up with uh, 126 qubits. So 50 less qubits than we originally computed for the full set of orbitals required for TS, lithium TFSI. And uh, this is certainly an, an improvement. Um, another technique involves the use of a more judiciously chosen active space. So the figure from the rightmost panel two slides ago. This example uh, involving the reaction of cyclopentadienone with ethylene um, to form norborinone, um, which proceeds through a transition state. Um, since this only, um, since the, the pi orbitals are the most important um, parts of the system, uh, we, we, we can actually just restrict it to pi orbitals. And when we do that, um, we actually um, would acquire, um, uh, let's see, eight, four, and 12 qubits for cyclopentadienone, ethylene, and transition state, respectively. And we can actually further reduce these numbers down by two by Planck spin parity reduction. And if we compare it to what we would um, what would be required if we actually use the full set of orbitals, we need 68, 28, and 96 qubits in order to represent these, um, these molecules um, respectively. So another technique that we have explored is exploiting the me molecular point group symmetries to, to taper off qubits. This is likely going to be of most use for small molecules such as gases and water but could also be somewhat useful for larger symmetric molecules. Of course, one can combine several of the techniques that, I, I, of the, that I've just mentioned in one computation in order to taper off as many qubits as possible. 
Um, more recently, we showed that large circuits can be bro broken down into many smaller circuits that can be simulated separately, then recombined to reconstruct the solution of the original problem. In other words, in, instead of a large experiment, a collection of small experiments can be correlated by classical post-processing. Now, the trade-off is that the circuits are more easily computed, but there are many more circuits. So as an example, this was done for the water molecule on real quantum hardware. This is normally a 10 qubit problem with course frozen and only one of the oxygen 2p orbitals represented um, in, in classical subspace. Um, this 10 qubit experiment was decomposed into many five qubit experiments, which could be done on the basis that two subsystems can be prepared comprising spin orbitals that map to spin up or spin down electrons. The researchers were able to re reproduce the symmetric stretching of the two OH bonds to a fair degree of accuracy in comparison to the exact result by, doing, by utilizing this technique. Um, and now I will start wrapping things up. Um, I will talk about some um, near-term use cases for quantum chemistry with quantum computers. Um, but before I begin, um, here are some of the types of investigations that we believe quantum chemistry could impact. Um, I want to highlight that we've made headway in many of these areas, such as being able to predict reaction energy, energetics or um, molecular properties. But one area that we are currently working on involves performing catalytic predictions. And this also has... Um, uh, has implications for looking at surfaces of reactions, uh, for example. So this is something that we're, we're, we're still currently working on. Um, now, I will highlight some of uh, our recent research efforts. Um, I will emphasize that many of these efforts were done in partnership with collaborators at universities and with clients, and I've, I've identified them on the slides. Um, so first, um, Chemical phenomenon that we would like to study doesn't always depend on the energy of the system. One example is shown here involving the simulation of the evolution of the spin dynamics of organic radical pair ions in the magnetic fields. And we have used the noise profile on the quantum device to actually simulate the spin dynamics. And this is a technique that could potentially be used to study uh, solid state uh, spin systems. Uh, one area of chemistry that we would like to have an impact on is in the area of uh, biochemistry. So um, on the, in the uh, chart on the left, um, we, sh um, we show, the, or sorry, the chart on the right highlights how a coarse grain technique in which groups of atoms or molecules that are, are represented as beads in order to investigate peptide and protein folding on quantum devices using a variant of the VQE algorithm. And we believe that this has um, a potential to, to uh, be applied to many different areas because, of course, biological molecules are, are very large, to, to say the least, to understate things. Um, and so we will, we will definitely need to um, reduce things as much as possible down to these representations in order to, to actually represent them on, um, on quantum devices. We've demonstrated the use of an active space to investigate the reaction mechanism for rearrangement process um, uh, proposed to occur in lithium air batteries. This process would normally require many qubits. In this case, we reduce the number of qubits required from four to six to just two by focusing on the active space for the reaction. On the right, um, uh, this uh, shows work that was done in collaboration with Daimler. Um, where we've shown how to compute ground state density matrices and dipole moments with uh, variational quantum algorithms um, on chemical species that may be generated in, excuse me, in a lithium sulfur battery. This example describes how to perform um, active space calculations in an embedding scheme in which the active space is simulated with quantum computation and core and valence orbitals are computed with density functional theory. And this is this um, uh, harkens back to a technique that I mentioned earlier in the talk. Um, this strategy helps to overcome limitations on the, the size of basis that's used for quantum computation. 
And of course, the scheme helps to reduce the number of qubits required for quantum simulations of large molecules by fo just focusing on the orbitals doing the chemistry. Um, many of the chemical processes that are of interest to industry are concerned with the properties of the excited states of molecules rather than the ground states. This is important for studying properties of OLEDs, solar cells, and photoacid generators, for example. Um, the left panel shows a publication that reports on the development of a new algorithm called QEOMVQE to uh, compute electronic excitations from occupied to virtual orbitals, that is to compute excited states. The panel on the right shows a paper highlighting the use of this algorithm for an application involving OLED materials. This was aided by combining um, calculations performed on quantum devices using a limited access space with error mitigation and state purification techniques to obtain um, chemically accurate results. Mr. Roland. <clears throat> We've also started to employ um, neural networks and quantum machine learning to chemistry problems. For example, um, we've shown how to use an artificial neural network to improve the precision of me measurement observ observables for chemical systems to arrive at more accurate results. We've also shown how to deploy um, quantum um, kernel-based machine learning methods to um, assist classical DFT methods to study disordered crystalline materials used in lithium ion batteries. And that was in collaboration with Daimler Mercedes Benz. Um, this was an example that was published just about a week ago. This is a collaboration with Mitsubishi Chem and um, K University in, in Japan. Uh, this involves a combination of classical and quantum computing techniques into a workflow for materials discovery. In this case, we investigate the use of classical qu quantum chemistry, classical uh, machine learning, um, factorization machine learning based uh, um, techniques and quantum optimization to find um, optimal, uh, optimally deuterated molecules with high quantum efficiencies that could be used as OLED emitters. Uh, so finally, um, chemists would like to simulate spectra as well as thermodynamic observables, since this is um, extremely important for identifying and characterizing molecules. And the publications uh, shown here highlight how to accomplish this. So uh, thank you for listening. I've left plenty of time for questions. Um, please don't hesitate to um, ask. I don't know if we're going to do it by chat or if we're just going to open up the microphone, but I'll stop sharing my slides and um, uh, uh, please feel free to, to ask us. Yeah, I think we can do both. We've got, um, yeah, let's thank our speaker again. This is really, really neat. Uh, we've, we've got a reasonably small enough group. So if people want to uh, unmute and ask a question, feel free. And then uh, it'd be great if you could raise your hand if you want to do that. And then if people want to put your questions in the chat, I, I think I have enough um, Friday afternoon, my brain cells left, so I can monitor the chat and moderate questions. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so a uh, question from Hillary. Sorry, getting used to my office setup. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I had a question about um, the um, paper that you mentioned where you use the nose noise profile of the qubits to um, tell you something about the spin dynamic. So that's really interesting to me because everyone's looking for fault tolerance and you know decreasing noise, but it sounds like in some sense that was actually useful for a physical system yes. that you're trying to think about. Yes, yes, and, and actually, um, this is a technique that a number of people have actually started using because um, uh, this has to do with um, these open quantum systems. And open quantum systems are of, of interest to 
a wide swath of people who want to look at electronic materials or to look at magnetic materials. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually pretty interesting. I don't know what will happen in the future if we if we reduce the, the noise so much that we can actually use it for these useful applications, maybe we can dial noise back in. I don't know, but um, like a very yeah, hardware it's, specific, like yeah, exactly. Question, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't actually know what's going to happen in the future, but yeah, this is this is an, an an area that a lot of people have actually started focusing their their interest in. Yeah, I have a process question. Um, so, so in all the different examples you showed in the end of the talk, where you talked about uh, projects you were working on, um, they they all were in a lot of really different areas. And so, I'm I'm wondering, um, you know, how many times are you approached about could you, and then of that, what fraction do you actually realize you've got the right tools to do the the work to start on the work? Because it, it you know it didn't seem like every single project was the next natural extension of the other one. They were very disparate. Yes, they were, yes, and and that's a very good question. Um, and actually, we we want them to be disparate because we want to um, have an impact on as many fields as possible and try to start um, setting down markers for as many fields as possible, making certain that um, quantum uh, computing is exposed to as many people as possible, so they know that it's possible to start working on applications in these spaces um and so yeah when we when we engage with with companies um typically you know we will they'll come to us and say okay we have a number of things that we could possibly um engage on and we we'll say uh, well you know this you know example a that's there's no way we can actually work on this example b maybe but we'll have to do some um, developments. So example C, that is is something that you know everyone knows how to do already with quantum computers. So yeah, that's this is not of interest to us. We wanna we wanna um, be at the frontier. We wanna be pioneers in, in certain areas, um, and and so this is this is what we do. We we hash out things between us and companies, but we also um, my team and other applications researchers also have their own interests and also have their own levels of expertise in various areas and they also want to uh, explore whether quantum computing would be of interest to um to the the application that they're also interested in so um so yeah i mean it's 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 very disparate but i think this is where my team at least want to be. We want to be as disparate as possible. Once it gets to the point where the companies start saying, oh, we want to actually use this for development, then that's where we hand this off to another team because we are not, we're not in the development, we're, we're research, right? So we're, there are other teams that handle development with companies that use the techniques that we've developed to actually develop out their portfolios, but but that's not what we're doing. Okay, okay, interesting. So here's a, a question from Dominic in the chat. Um, I don't have prior knowledge of quantum computing, but how, how do you offset the noise that can affect quantum computers due to the difficulty of engineering, programming, and building the system? Um, so this is uh, this is probably more of a question for someone on the harder side than for me. Um, we we um, the uh, right now there's a lot of work going on in terms of actually the design of the the layouts of the circuits themselves, which will help to mitigate the noise. Uh, also, in terms of um, going down to the very um, uh basic hardware level and looking at the pulses and trying to see whether we can actually use the pulses to to mitigate um to mitigate noise um and so you know i i, I think this is a, a question that's 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 better posed to someone else who is you know working on the hardware side but um I, i'll give you that as a lead in to to um to how this this uh question would be approached by, by those people. Yeah, these are good questions. No problem. All right, I see another question. Wow, we got three. 
Okay. All right, so Jim uh, Mark. Hello, uh, really cool uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I was just curious, um, is there, do you see the, is, is there, are, is anyone still working on adiabatic quantum computing? Is that still like uh, a viable thing? I know it's less general, but easier to scale, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I shouldn't talk about other companies, but I will say that yes, people are still working on it. We we do we have <laughs> noted that we have noted that other companies that were the leaders in adiabatic uh, quantum computing have I, I don't know if switch gears would be the right term, but they have started to also focus on superconducting. Um, uh, circuit. So, um, so I don't know if, if I don't know why that decision was made, but it's it's interesting that that decision was made. But people, yeah, but people are still working on on the adiabatic uh, quantum computing. Okay, thanks. All right. Yeah, I see Raymond and then uh, Hugh Young and Santosh. Yeah, yeah. Great presentations. Enjoying your presentation on the information. I have two questions. The first one is on the uh, the finite element area. I see one of your child mentioned about the finite element computing. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see the quantum computing the uh, benefit to the finite element area? First of all, uh, well, I, I don't actually know. <laughs> That's something that uh, we have not explored. We, as I mentioned, we that is much, that is I think more on the engineering um, end of the, the spectrum. And we haven't actually started looking at using quantum computing for um, for some of these um, other types of applications. So yeah, I, I don't know if anyone who's actually done this. Um, maybe there are people who are, who are exploring it. We're, we have not started exploring it at IBM as far as I'm aware. Okay. The second question I have is the, on the nanotechnology area. And how is quantum computing to be able to tie to the nanotechnology so that the result can be seen uh, faster as well as to be able more accurately, you know, modeling it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, I, you know, I, so it depends on, 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 I guess, what, I think nanotechnology is a very, it's, it's a large area, right? So I'm not really certain um, what specifically you're talking about, but I could see the impact on, say, you know, I spoke about battery technology and I spoke about um, some of the things that we've done with batteries. I spoke about um, things that we've done with oil EDs. Um, so, and, you know, with oil EDs and with batteries, it's not only about quantum chemistry, we've also looked at um, machine learning as well as optimization and, and how it, they can actually be used within content so um so i i think that at least for now it's, it appears to be that those would be the areas that would um or the applications that would would um apply to the nanotechnology space but yeah i, I just haven't really thought too much um, as much as i need to about that yet. okay thank you yeah so maybe we could there's a question in the chat uh, let me, let's get to that, and then we'll get to Hugh Young, if Hugh Young doesn't mind. So, uh, do you envision there will ever be personal quantum computing? If so, when? And we won't hold you to your answer. We won't call back and you know say, well, you're off by five years. And then, um, how can someone get uh, someone interested in quantum computing get involved now? And I'll, I'll go ahead and put a little um, kind of joke picture in the chat, which was up in the chemical engineering office at UCLA. Maybe you didn't see it if you didn't come across the quad to Bolter Hall, but I'll put that up there. Uh -huh. Okay. How can you um, become a quantum okay. mechanic? <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, yeah, this is this is a, a good question. It's probably one of those questions that um, that trap people, right? Right? Will there ever be a personal quantum computer? I remember at one time, um, IBM, the person who was in charge of IBM, the CEO of IBM, did not believe there would ever be like a personal computer for anyone. <laughs> and, and then IBM became the leader of <laughs> producing personal computers for everyone. <laughs> so that's that's actually a trap question, right? So I, I don't wanna, I can't commit on that question. I can say that right now, 
IBM is 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 focused on development of quantum computers for um, for uh, for you know uh, enterprise applications. So th these are applications that are being used by other companies or by governments or um, or by national labs and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, and in, in terms of when there would be a transition between uh, what we're doing with enterprise and going into personal, I, I have no idea. I'm not. I'm, I, I won't commit to that question at all. <laughs> um, not required to answer every question. <laughs> uh, uh, how can someone get in? Uh, someone interested in quantum computing get involved? So there are lots and lots and lots of resources. Um, if you go to, um, uh, if you just search for quantum computing IBM, um, you will um, come across resources um, on the on using Qiskit. You will come across um, resources on um, being able to connect to a quantum computer. You, uh, when you get inside of, once you, once you create an account, it's free. Um, you can you can actually freely run simulations on the quantum computers that are are um, are some of our quantum computers. Um, you you will come across uh, learning resources from the same portal. You you will. Um, there are lots and lots of their textbooks. There are lots and lots of talks being hosted by IBM that are publicized. So there are lots and lots of resources out there. Um, uh, and you know, outside of IBM too, like there are also lots of resources. I'm not saying that IBM is the uh, the 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 the, the, the touchstone for all of this. But there are lots of lots of free resources that are out there that you can um, utilize. All right, great. And then, uh, yeah, thank you, Richard, for your question. Let's go to Hugh Young. Uh, hi, Gavin. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk. So uh, we know that for um, if we want to do the error cor correction, right, we may use many physical qubit to form a logical qubit. So for all in your presentation, for the qubit, are they logical qubit or physical qubit? And also my question, another question is, uh, for all the computer that you put that can be publicly accessed to us, are those uh, all in logical qubit or physical qubit? They're all, so yeah, um, so right, uh, all of what I've talked about is physical qubits and all of the ones that um, that you can access right now are, uh, have, you, you're utilizing phys physical qubits. Um, so what we're focused on right now is instead of error correction, we're focused on error mitigation, and and with error mitigation, we don't actually have to use many cube, many physical qubits to create this logical qubit. Um, so that is currently the focus of many um, of many groups and many companies. IBM is the only one who's focused on on error mitigation currently. We're hoping that at some point in the future when we have larger quantum computers, we will actually, we will require error correction using when we have these larger quantum computers to actually get anything out of it. So um, this is something that, um, that needs to, to, to happen and it will probably happen once we have the larger quantum computers. Right, Santos, she had her hand raised. Oh, okay, yeah, excellent talk, uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, but uh, my question is about uh, the current, you know, status of uh, using this. You know, I think this is about variational quantum eigensolver uh, instead of just using, you know, uh, quantum phase estimation uh, that requires yeah. this uh, quantum error correction. So, yeah. when do you think this will be feasible? Uh, you know, near term or you know long term uh, so uh, can so, you comment yeah yeah so for uh, first to use quantum phase estimation we will um, need to start being able to um, to actually run longer circuits um, and yeah I, I don't know when this will will happen um, uh, we've over over time 
um, the quantum volumes of the, the devices have, have gotten better. Um, it's kind of difficult, even though it seems like it's related, it's kind of difficult to say whether quantum volume has anything to do with what we can actually do in chemistry. So that's something that we need to actually suss out because um, uh, quantum, you know, that's that's a metric that they use to look at the, the quality of the, the circuits that we're, we're, we're creating. But, um, you know, whether or not that has anything to do with chemistry, especially for VQE, which is a complicated um, kind of algorithm, that's still unknown. And I think there is research that has shown that VQE isn't we, we we're, we're not we're never going to get quantum advantage using VQE we need to actually um use other algorithms that um that are more faithful to like phase estimation for example mm -hmm. that um where we can actually start getting to some type of quantum algorithm so some, some of come quantum advantage sorry so okay and uh does this also include the limitation uh in uh currently available this quantum hardware yes so the 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 current quantum hardware that we have as i mentioned on the talk we we can only use like maybe uh, routinely like 10 qubits we can go up to around 20 um because even though we have like uh say maybe 65 or 130 qubits or whatever um, we can only use a subset of those before the errors just like swamp out everything and you're just going to get noise and spurious results and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, we right now we can't really um, do quantum phase estimation. We can't do VQE even on like large or large systems of, of qubits. Thank you. Problem. All right, we're coming up on time, but I see uh, one last question in the chat. Um, how many computational algorithms have quantum versions currently? Uh, E.g., does the traveling sa salesman problem have a quantum version? No pressure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come, uh, quantum, that number uh, act correct. <laughs> I, I actually, yeah, I don't know. There's 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 a thing called the quantum zoo that um, that covers this. I I haven't looked at this in a long time. So, you know, feel free to actually, um, feel free to look at, uh, at the quantum zoo to see whether or not anything that, that is covered there. Um, but a traveling salesman problem, uh, that, is, that is, I believe, something that a lot of uh, companies and, and researchers are, are working on. All right, great. So we're, we're just about at four o'clock. Uh, I'd like to thank our speaker again. Um, if you're still feeling the science, uh, I'll just give a shout out to the College of Sciences virtual seminar. So their associate dean for research, uh, Dr. Mary Van Hoven, is talking in a minute, and I put the link in the chat. And hers will be totally different, but it's another what I would call frontier talk. She's going to be talking about um, the uh, genetics and activity that shape the developing neural circuit, working with model system, the model system of C. elegans. So maybe Gavin, if you want to check it out, if you're <laughs> you're welcome to join too. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I see lots of thanks coming through in the chat. Thank you to all. Great to meet yeah. you. Uh, thank yeah. you again. Bye. Feel to reach out. Um, feel free. All right. Wonderful. Thank you again. Okay, have a safe. Have a safe drive home, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could get in my car because of my toe, but I can't. <laughs> we will have a virtual opportunity. We'll try to or a real opportunity. We'll try to figure something out maybe next semester. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Great to see you. Bye. -bye.